And now, now I would like to ask Dr. Justyna Melanowska about her lecture, um, uh, because Dr. Justyna Melanowska will uh, speak about relations between emancipation and human rights, human rights discourse. Um, uh, Dr. Melanowska um, will ask uh, about, is it necessary to use this discourse to speak about women's needs and problem in the modern world? Thank you. The title of my expose is Rights are Weak Unless They Are Duties. And the first part is very brief, very short. The discourse on rights and the problem of emancipation. The first question that interests me here is whether we really have to use the language of rights to discuss women's problems. Can anyone who rejects this language be heard at all or is it somehow outside the scope of modern discourse culture? We know that the notion of the barbarian at its historical core implied someone excluded from the Greek language community, someone who does not belong to the ecumene, the common word. It seems that the language of rights is today's Greek and whoever fails to use it must be regarded as a barbarian in two ways, not only by rejecting certain language practices, but also as someone who probably refuses to accept women's rights as such. So my first conclusion is that the question must be asked today about the possibility of emancipation from the emancipation. So the emancipation, um, the right to refuse the acquisition and extension of the rights. Uh, look at us women here, what we are trying to do here and now sitting in our rooms is to uh, carry out a kind of conquest of the language of rights, which is today tied to the liberal problem of negative freedom. But as some of us are conservative, we are obliged to respect the reality. So being respectful towards reality, let's talk about, uh, about rights. And here, uh, part two of my expose starts. I will be speaking about the sources, the sources of rights. The two strong sources for all rights, God and human nature. Interestingly, um, Today I shall not discuss the issue of natural law uh, that comes with it. Interestingly enough, these are precisely the sources that the modern times have rejected. There are also three weak sources of rights, and they are contract, need, and custom. Let us have uh, a look at these. First, rights obtained by means of contract. Anything can be agreed upon. Therefore, any, everything can turn out to be a right and everything can turn out to be a violation of someone's rights. Remarkably, rights acquired in this manner do not have to be consensual. Access to power and legislative procedure is sufficient. The process of negotiating rights through a contract is often of a forceful nature, and the discourse of rights is associated with the discourse of struggle, race, class, or gender struggle. Rights must be won by fighting. The losing party must live as if they recognize these rights, although this may involve taking up almost everything they think about human, and even what most humans thought about it for at least 2,000 years. Example here is, of course, same-sex se same reasons uh, equal of marriages. So here the conclusion would be that rights acquired by contract are often the result of force and influence. Roger Scruton also said that of intimidation and terror. So their basis is weak and we may be doubtful if they are what they pretend to be and this is progress in humanism. The second source of rights is need or desire, as Professor uh, Del Sol uh, said. Let's, but, but I will be speaking of needs. 
Leszek Kowakowski has illustrated this with the following very simple example. I have the right to rest after a whole day's work. So I need to rest. What can be said about the need? Above all, perhaps, that the need can be justified or not. For example, I have indeed worked hard all day and I am tired. Or I have not worked hard at all. When it comes to the social processes, it is not clear who and how would test the legitimacy of our needs, who would prioritize them, and on what principle shall we grant or deny rights. In fact, modern societies are condemned to self-declaration of the needs of different people and groups. And it is assumed here that the law must come from the need. For example, if someone says he or she has a need to change his or her sex, they must have the right to change their sex and legal solution should, uh, solutions should follow. This is a common conviction, I would say a superstition in our times. Interestingly, the obvious problem of any sort of barrier capable of stopping at some point the acquisition of rights justified by the need is not discussed. However, what if we keep in mind the problem of need but go back to the classic answer concerning the person from the whole Western personalist tradition. We assume after Boetius that a person is an individual, a rational being, and then free and relational. The problem we face here is a free articulation of reason in the community of persons. When one takes the nature of the person, the acquisition of rights appears as follows. First, we have the nature of the person. So the fact that I have, that I am a reasonable, a reasonable creature and I live in relations. Then comes the need for articulation because my ration, rational nature needs to be expressed in the community. Then I get the right to articulation. The right is uncaught in the person in my nature and it's, it's expressing my nature. Then when I articulate my reasonable nature, I have a possible merit because if I have articulated good, I have the merit. And if I have articulated wrong, it does not bring the merit. And if I have the merit, I have the right resulting from the merit. So here we have the whole process. Different thinkers have dealt with the issue of nature uh, and human condition in social context. I will take just briefly two thinkers totally different, uh, who uh, two totally different, and I will compare two approaches. First is Karol Wojtyla, who stands firm on the basis of the concept of human nature as a person. And the second is Hannah Arendt, who writes about human condition. Wojtyla believed that a person's participation in a community is authentic or not. As authentic, it can be solidarity or objection. As inauthentic, conformism or avoidance. The fundamental rights of the person is therefore the articulation in the community of persons. Of course, I am not taking those thinkers today very profoundly. I'm just more inspired by them. Arendt, Hannah Arendt in turn, distinguished three principles of humanum corresponding to the three basic conditions under which man has been given life on earth and those are work, production, and action. So it can be said that the human condition here gives the need to work, to produce, and to act, and from this in turn comes the right to work, produce, and act. What is interesting here is that we can ask what are the specific forms of action, work, and production carried out by women? Well, the most obvious answer is that specificity of female action was and is 
everything related to motherhood. So conclusion from this part would be needs can provide a stable basis for the acquisition of rights if, if they are linked to a concept of a human nature, a nature as a person or human condition. And now the third and final source of rights is custom. This is a very important matter and very underestimated, I think. According to the classical tradition, a custom is, uh, is an informal standard of behavior sanctified by a tradition observed by the general public. In antiquity, the custom had a sacred character and sanction. Its observance was more important than the observance of the law. The custom was also considered to be a moral law. Nowadays, the influence of custom on, uh, on the creation of legal norms is low, uh, in law is disappearing. How does custom relate to women's rights? Well, it is customary to stabilize the social roles and to organize the sphere of individual aspirations. It teaches what it means to be a woman, mother or daughter, widow or, for example, teacher. But it also teaches all aspects of social interaction. For example, how to behave towards a mother, an elderly woman, or a teacher. It is a fundamental right of a person who takes a customary social role to live in a community that respects the custom. Therefore, a woman mother has the right to preserve the custom in the community in which she performs her social role. As for specific rights in this area, we can talk about negative and positive rights as for the vector. A negative right would, would be, for example, freedom from pornography, at least in the public sphere, but also freedom from all kinds of indecent behavior. Positive rights, for example, would be the right, um, would be uh, the access to good and proper custom-wise education for, ch for children. So here the conclusion is, taking the custom as their basis, the rights would focus primarily on stabilizing the execution of women's social roles, especially maternal and educational ones. To see how important customs are, uh, we should remember what Tacitus said, legus sine moribus vane proficient, uh, laws without uh, law is worth nothing where there is no custom. And the summary is uh, on women's right. rights. Taking into account everything that has been said above, women's rights are divided into negative ones, freedom from something, and positive ones, right to something. And according to their source, rights based on contract, need, or a custom. On what concerns need, they can be based on the self-declaration of the subject, the concept of human person or human condition. This allows us to distinguish between strong and weak rights. How does this work in practice? Just a few examples. A strong right based in human nature as a person would be a negative right from being spoken, being articulated. For example, we are now having in Warsaw some initiatives uh, known that, that are known under the slogan Women's Strike. Such initiatives violate the rights of articulation of, of women who are not represented by the protesters and who are included in the term women. The positive uh, right of articulation established in human nature results, for example, in electoral rights for women. Weak rights, mostly auto-declarative, need center uh, rights would be, for example, a negative right related to the self-declarative need of the subject, I don't want it, results in, for example, the right to abort the fetus, I don't want it, I need not to have it, I have right not to have it. Positive vector rights that are self-declared uh, in the subject's need are, for example, the right to change one's sex. I need to change my sex. I have right to change my sex. 
If we accept, if we, however, accept the concept of human person, we see that rights become stronger. For example, if we accept the fact that the person is, in Latin, alteri incommunicabilis and sui juris, that means that she can't be owed in, owned in any sense by anyone, therefore, uh, for example, a woman can't be mutilated, uh, uh, raped, forced to have in sexual intercourse, forced into marriage, etc. But what is more, the right to integrity is not based in any kind of auto-declaration, but in the human person as such. Therefore, even if a woman wants us, wants us to break her integrity, we may not do it. We have a duty and obligation to respect her uh, nature as a person. Uh, similarly, the rights arising from any concept of the human condition give rise to the right to work or to take up and fulfill the role of the mother and other social roles. Of course, the sphere of rights always creates an immense potential for abuse. For instance, the right to take up and pursue the role of a mother can lead to demanding for the right to a child. Therefore, always and everywhere, if we mean the welfare, welfare of individuals and communities, we should give priority to and even abide by human responsibilities, human duties. The field for abuse is much narrower here. And my closing, my closing note is this. All I said so far, is very weak indeed. If I wanted to criticize this lecture from liberal positions, I could do it, do it in many ways. If I wanted to criticize it, for example, um, taking from the starting point, uh, um, John Stuart uh, Mill's idea of harm, I would say, first of all, that the existence of rights is precisely the answer to the unbearable uh, full of harm, fact of human condition. The rights protect from harm. We may interestingly argue on that, but finally, I think the concept of human condition turns out not to be what we are looking for while searching for the basis for rights. A more certain ground is provided by the concept of human as a person, and the most certain ground by far is to embrace the existence of a personal God as a source and guarantee of this nature. But here we learn not that much about rights. God does not say you have rights. We learn most, mostly about duties. You shall, you shall not, though shall not. Thank you very much.